So what I need to do is to change my laptop, because my presentation is on my laptop, so we need to have a few minutes there. Uh, is it, uh, okay. Guys, how are you? Come on, see something. Hi, hi. Why I'm trying to make that? Uh, can you put it on the big screen? Sorry for that, guys. I just want to make sure it works. Oh, there it is. And uh, it's not time for work. What I'm going to do first, I'm going to take a picture of you guys because I take pictures of what I do. Right? So I want you to be very smallly. Come on, guys. Right now, come on, guys. More. Ah, this is awesome. Thank you so much. You'll be on Facebook and everywhere very soon. <laughs> Okay, so let's see if that works. So brand new presentation, I was asked last to come again, and they said, you have to make a better presentation than last year in terms of visual. And of course, it's not starting, so I'm going to press the here. No, 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 Because it's so complicated. Oh my god, I took like hours to make this, and then it needs to be working. Yes, it's finally there. Okay, so you, some of you know me. Right, I was here last year, Frankie and Emily, we don't do repeat speakers, and I'm actually back. So thank you so much, Frank, that me for actually inviting me again to this beautiful country. And again, I have to leave tomorrow morning, so again, I'm going to miss more. So actually, what makes this country amazing, so I'm really sorry. Which also means that, again, I will have to come back one more someday to actually visit the beautiful country you live in. So you know me, probably, if those who don't know, I'm called Paul Papadimitriou. Yeah, I'm partially Greek. I was born in Switzerland. I do scale for innovation globally. I travel all around the world. I'm very lucky to do that. But today I want to, be, I want to ask you only one question. How do you travel? Hello? <laughs> well, there's some answer. Go on. Go on. Light. Yeah, that's a very good thing. If you travel like me, you should. For free? Oh, wow, well, I don't know. Tell me how to do that because, I mean, I will, that's my biggest cost every year is actually plane tickets. Travel is actually many things to different people. Travel is, obviously, for some people, it's an obligation because it's work. For some people, it's the trip of a lifetime. For some people, it's the visit family, relative. For some people, it's immigration or migration. It's really many things to, to different people. It's never actually something that we can share with each other. We all have different experiences about why do we travel and how do we travel. I am very lucky to be traveling. Well, this year I already did like 100,000 miles. I think they were like arriving in June. I'm very lucky to be traveling, but my travels has nothing to do with other travels. But you know what I like about travels? Most people think I like the distance. I like this. I like airplanes. Since I was a kid, I love being in an airplane. The airplane is my favorite part of the travel. I, I know it sounds stupid. I actually even have a good guess about that. Well, this is good. I, it's really, the airplanes is really what makes me happy. At first, it's the wonder of this. You know, this was, this is an Embraer 195. You don't care, but they just use a new plane as well. I wanted to give them this little thing. I say it's a wonder. When I see an aircraft, I see the technology that allows us to suddenly travel and take off the earth. I'm still a kid. I found that amazing that you can still do this. The second thing that happens when I travel is place life. Place life is a term that's been invented by a pilot who's uh, flying 747s for British Airways. Uh, and he invented that term, which I really like. If you've ever done long haul travel, when you go to, I don't know, Hong Kong, you go to India, when you go to Sydney, and you have this kind of, you know, the jet lag, the place life is even better. You are in a different place, suddenly, like in a few hours, you're in a different place. Plus, you wake up in the middle of the night, have the best memories of wake up in the middle of the night in Tokyo. And you're like, and you feel everything. Everything is being felt. That's the second thing that I really love about travel. And the last one, which is for me the most important one, is introspection. The reason I love being in an airplane, somebody said alone, is because it's my alone time. Most people think I'm an extrovert, I'm actually an introvert. When I'm in a plane, I don't use Wi-Fi, I have my noise cancelling headphones, and I can do anything. I watch through the window, this is landing in, actually, Iceland, in Reykjavik, a few months ago. All these videos were done by me. I am so happy to be alone, to think this is my best moment of creativity. 
is when I'm alone in the plane, I don't work, I think. And this is why I love travel. The way you actually put these words together is the journey. We all are on journeys. I love the journey of travel, but we all are in life on journeys anyway. All our lives are about journeys. Brian just used the term journey of receiving our marketing, but everything is about the journey. When I put these three words together, introspection, place, life, honor, which are the three words I use to describe my way of traveling, if I actually translate them, they mean identity, it means discovery, and it means technology. These are the three key words that drive my life, that drive my work, and I think that drive actually all of our lives. It's always the three words. And since this might be a little bit not obvious to understand, these are the three questions you should always ask. Who are we? Where do we want to go? And how do we get there? Everything I do in life is about these three questions. Who am I? Where do I want to go? And how do we get there? Everything, every time I work with clients, I ask these three questions. Who are you? Where do you want to go? And how will you get there? This is everything. All the journeys in life, our life, others, the journey that we work on when we work with your clients are about these three questions. Always these three questions. We always need to overstate technology. Now this technology is so cool. We talk about technology all the time. Technology, 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 technology. And it goes fast and sexy and it's fun. Yes, it is. I love technology. I'm a geek. I've technology since I was a kid. I was, my father offered me really my first computer. Even though he had, never had computers, he gave me that when I was probably, what, nine years old and said, you know what? Figure it out. This is the future. I love technology. But we all tend to overstate what technology is. Technology, of course, was always there. These are all technology. In fact, we invented the fire, the, the wheel, the printing machine, the newspaper. These are all technologies. This is nothing new. We have to mechanistify what technology is. The same thing that happened in, in our century where, oh, I don't know about Okay. The same thing happened in our century. Actually, technology was going faster and faster and faster and reaching this new era where there's so many devices that I'm not even sure it matters that we count them anymore. Unless you're an analyst, you can do that. It doesn't really matter. We have to stop putting technology forward. I love this one because it's how fast technology is adopted. You know, it took 75 years for the phone to be uh, adopted by 100 million users in the world. It took one year for what? The video should tell you. Okay, who knows? No? Look, there are gummies. Candy Crush. It took exactly one year to, for this technology, for this app, for this game, to reach 100 million. And again, does it matter? It's a fun thing to you tell you at the conference, but does it actually matter? The only thing to choose you is technology going faster, but it really doesn't matter. What happens is then, when we overwhelm with this kind of technology, we start thinking about the future is bleak. We hear the rise of the robots, because we, all the robots will take our jobs away. We hear that, you know, we're being tracked all the time, probably part of it is true. And we start thinking about these doomsday scenarios. Skynet is going to wake up, the Terminator is going to kill me. And, and honestly, this is what I see. I see a lot of people being afraid. Suddenly, technology was not supposed to be something that makes, her, makes us afraid. And I see more and more people everywhere I go, from Asia to Latin America, to Europe, obviously, I see people being afraid of technology, of what it could do. My kids are with technology. My kids are sexing all the time. They will not be normal. Technology, people are afraid of technology. The more and more they are afraid. To me, though, the only definition of technology that should matter is this. This is how I define technology. Technology is what we invent to make our life better. This is all there is. Technology should just be that. Technology is what we invent to make our life better. We shouldn't talk about technology first. We should put the other way around. Technology is last. This is the how we will get there. The part, the most important part is here, identity discovery. Remember the three questions. This is how we will get there. It doesn't matter how we will get there. This is the last question you ask. Technology should not be first. 
And where are we? Where do we want to go? How do we get there? And that leads to three questions. The travel, obviously, is very obvious. Who are we? And we pick it. I work with airlines. I work with trade with travel. The way people travel, for, for instance, in this part of the world, in Eastern Europe, is not the same that people travel in Southeast Asia, for instance. There are cultural differences. Why? Because who are we? It matters. The same, have, the same applies, of course, to marketing. I hate, I hate to use the term marketing because most, most people think marketing about just doing campaigns anyway, but use it anyway. When we talk about customer journeys, and some of you do that, I've launched a smartphone. You know, Ubuntu, Ubuntu OS, I helped launch uh, Ubuntu Mobile in China. These are the same question I asked. My old job was doing that. Very nicely painting that, basically. Is. Who are we? Who's the customer? Where do you want to go? Well, how do you get there? Always the same good question. The same with the for innovation. Exactly when I talk to startups, when I work with someone, they invest, I actually invested in a startup last night. I forgot to do the wire transfer, so thank, thank God there's good internet here. I hope that I'm not being spoofed now. But who are we? Where do we want to go? How do we get there? The same question on marketing, the same question applies to innovation. It's always the same question. You can, you can answer everything with these three questions. If you have an answer to these questions, or at least if you think about these three, the three questions, you'll be able to define yourself better. Identity, discovery, technology. Identity is the actual disruption, not technology. Identity, the way we are being brought up nowadays, the way that the fact that we can connect with anyone in the world, the fact that we can speak, that can be here with you, and then I'll leave and I'll still be in contact with you, all this changes the way we perceive identity. It changes the way our kids perceive identity. And you have to connect the dots at the end of their parents' brain. Why? Because why do you think people vote for Trump? Why do you think people are where about to vote for a far right um, president in Austria? Why do you think you have this kind of Duterte in the Philippines? Why do you think people are that? People just like, oh yeah, this guy with his hair in the US. It's not that. People are afraid. They're afraid of change, but they're afraid because this identity, they say, who are we? They cannot define themselves the same way they used to. We should understand these people instead of simply saying, oh, because you vote that or that, you're a bad person. They're afraid. They're afraid that we talk about the fact that, oh, all your jobs are going to be lost. They've already been lost, by the, by the way, if you look in the U.S. and some, some parts of the U.S. I come from, I was, I was born in Switzerland, but I come from Greece. But as you know, youth unemployment, 18 to 25, you know, the number is 62%. 62% from 18 to 25 don't have a job. They're afraid. They're afraid. So don't judge them. We have to stop thinking about technology being the disruption, but identity being the disruption. People don't rely on what they wear to use the way they used to. Brian said it earlier. We had rules, but we had boxes. It was easy. It's not the case anymore. And the same applies, obviously, I call that innovation inequality, between countries and even between companies. You see the fact that, oh, it's very easy when you do a startup, oh, I'm going to disrupt these guys. I'm going to disrupt this industry. I'm going to disrupt. Yes, and you will. But then, why do you think people are reacting? Why do you think Uber is being banned in so many countries? Of course, the explanation is, yeah, there are unions and there are lobbyists. I used to be a lobbyist, so I know how it works. Because people are afraid. And this is not how we should be thinking. We should realize why we are afraid. Not think about the technology, but think about the identity. And you know that very well in this, in this region. You're, in your region that has been in the study region, as a major in the university, or in the studies, you know that better than me. You know, you know what it means to have you had a war here that was not so long ago because of that. Because of identity. Identity is always the key. It's always the key. Real disruption of identity. And you know what? For me, because now I've been gloomy, the reality is that I'm actually extremely hopeful. I think we actually are changing the world. These are, this is the reality. 
we are seeing the largest middle class emergence in the world ever. 2.5 billion people will emerge and become middle class in the world. All emerging countries, including in this EU, of course, the big part of it is China. <laughs> That's the most important thing. The largest workforce in the world ever. One billion women will enter the workforce in the next. One billion women will enter the workforce in the next 10 years. Are we? Because men sometimes don't listen to that. I still work with companies and look at the board and look at the employees and they're always white, old males. How the fuck do you think you're going to understand a lot of women because of white old males? But honestly, the world is not made for women. It was designed by people like me, older probably, by people like me. You've read it all already. You have many, many articles about that. You know that the average settings of the air conditioning in an office was set according to the weight of the male. No wonder females would say, oh, I'm really cold. And we are like, no, of course not. These are little things like that. The world was not made. How the fuck, I'm sorry, how the fuck will these people understand? When one billion women only will enter the workforce, but then also will have purchasing power. 82% of the decisions of purchase in the world are made by women. 82%! We think as men that, yeah, of course, I control this. Oh, no, of course not. You never control It's always the woman I control. So we see that disconnect between that reality and how the companies are behaving. They're just not going to work. Of course, the age, the same thing will happen. I used to live in, in Japan and Tokyo. You can see this, the first country that will be seeing this huge shift in age. These are new opportunities here. People are getting older and older and older. We make less kids. And I think this will apply to a lot of actually of other countries as well, not only you know, Japan. And, and I know this is hard to believe, when people ask me, Paul, it's very hard to find money. The largest wealth transfer in history will happen within the next 10 years as well. $17 trillion, depending on the estimates, will actually change hands. Why? Because the people that made money after the Second World War, they were basically they're getting old and they're transferring this money to their kids. Which also means that these kids are actually younger, which also means that they have a different mindset. Which also means that they, can, they will see the world differently as well. Maybe not them, they will be some assholes with this thing. You know what? That's going to be a huge change. If you have all these things happening at the same time, for me, we are living in the biggest world upgrade ever. It's going to rewire entirely the way we think. The little things that we thought, the fact that we could connect on Facebook, the fact that the entrepreneurs can create their being as easy to put in to life, all these things add up. And we are seeing a total rewiring of the resources a complete rewire. It doesn't feel like it right now, because it's just starting, but trust me, it's going to be, and people, I think that it's going to be the biggest opportunity ever to actually change this planet. The largest ever to change this planet. This one, you know, the computer doesn't want to change the planet like this. Again, where are we? Where do we want to go? If you ask this question to Siri, this is what she answers. Technology hasn't caught up with emotions. Technology hasn't caught up with actually understanding these type of introspective questions. Maybe one day it will. Maybe one day we'll actually wake up and you know, artificial intelligence will make them so much smarter. But I think if you're a mother, if you're a father, if you have a family, if you're an innovator, if you're an entrepreneur, you're like a good traveler. You know what defines a good traveler? A good traveler is someone who's not afraid to go in an unknown territory. When you're an entrepreneur, you do the same thing. You know, you create something and offshore it goes. When you do when you are for the first time a mother and a father, you don't know where you're going. You bring a child to life and then you have to figure it out. Innovators, entrepreneurs, parents, we're not afraid of unknown territories. We're never afraid of unknown territories. This is exactly why I'm very hopeful. Because we welcome the unknown. These people, this generation, your generation, if you guys in countries like Montenegro, in countries like Eastern Europe, emerging countries, have this type of mindset. You have this type 
of mindset. You understand the challenges. See, when I was, oh, I was talking about the number of women, the number of people actually applauded, you get that. And you have the possibility. And you're not afraid. Unlike a lot of people are afraid. You are not afraid. And we shouldn't be afraid. We, we will create a better planet. I'm very optimistic. I know it's very easy to do. We will create a better planet. We are building a better planet. All of us, we are actually already doing it. We are using these small building blocks, each on our own, sometimes together, sometimes separately. We are building because of these forces that appear. Who are we? Where do we want to go? And how do we get there? The one thing I talked about people being afraid, we have to enable people not to be afraid. It's too easy to just to point fingers and said earlier, oh, people vote this and that because they're afraid. Yeah, okay, do that on Facebook and after face. The point is, we should enable people not to be afraid. We should be building an odyssey all together. It's very easy for me to say that I'm privileged, you know, I'm the white old male that we're talking earlier. I was born in Switzerland, the richest country in the world. Also the second highest, longest uh, longevity, longevity, probably of uh, a good old age. So I'm very privileged. But what I want to do, the one thing that you're going to ask me the question that is your spark is that, is making people not being afraid. You're not afraid if you do it once, then you understand that you're going to be okay. So instead of finger pointing the people that don't agree with you, instead of finger pointing the people that are afraid, teach them not to be afraid. Be a hero for that. How? I'm not going to give you an answer because it's too complicated. But I was trying really hard to, to say, how can I show on a slide how not to be afraid? How can I display it? Because it's easy for me to say it. How can I say it? And I said, okay, I'm going to do something fun. I'm going to show living on the edge, but it actually means being living on the edge. By disrupting myself. I've never been... I've always liked to be uncomfortable. I was a shy person and I'm on stage and hiding behind my mother. I'm an introvert and I fake the fact that I'm an extrovert. I always like to be uncomfortable. This is why that I like my plane a lot of time. But how can I show you this? I took the plane to Macau, the highest tower can ever you can legally jump from. And this is, there's a lot of fox there actually. And I jumped. It's 233 meters, you bungee jumping. Trust me, when you're on the ledge, like this, and you're about to jump, you do this. Yeah, this is, yeah. I still like to be shaking when I see that, this should be fun. When you're actually about to do this, your entire body tells you what to fucking do to Stop it. You know, you want to hold, you know, there's all the bi your biology is actually making no way, you're not going to jump, are you crazy? And, you know, and I was like, this, like, probably was just, like, not even like a split second, I was so scared, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. But when, ah, look at my smile again. Be a comfortable. Jump. Always jump. I'm Paul Thank you so much. Thank you. This is your stage, not mine. Thank you. So you talk a lot about the fear and how we have that interest resistance. Oh, we want to be yeah. seated. Okay. Why not? Oh, and by the way, before you go there. Mm -hmm. So I tried, guys. Uh, I tried. People told me, Paul, you have to have better shoes than last year, which last year were in gold. So I don't know. I didn't know what to do. So I went for the red because it's sparkly to me. So I hope you're happy. It's very on brand. It's for Thank the red. <laughs> so um, you speak about that desire for change, and it's not something we're born with. Uh, is there a schedule? Is there a timeline uh, of time where we need to change? And I saw that on your Facebook you wrote. That you yourself asked your Facebook, should I die again? Yeah, it was 10 years ago. So 10 years ago, I changed my life. I changed my life many times. But 10 years ago, because again, I like to be accountable. 10 years ago, I was uh, 
75 kilos more, had a girlfriend, had a flat, had a job, and like in exactly one week, I quit the girlfriend, quit my job, and two months later, I was 75 kilos less. No, sorry, 30, no, I'm talking count, so that's 38 kilos less. And I changed completely that day, it was about exactly 10 years ago. There's no time. Sometimes it's a trigger, sometimes it's because something happens to you that you have no control of, and you're like, oh shit, the reason I quit my girlfriend is more complicated than that, I basically, to make the story short, I arrived in the flat, I opened the door, and my apartment was empty, she took everything and she left. So obviously when you have that, you're like, hmm, but you know, so there's always something, a trigger, but that trigger then maybe continue because then maybe not being afraid. You know, the first five minutes, I used to be someone that was very angry, so I would shout at people and be like very authoritative. You know, that was my Greek blog, if you want. You know, like that still shows at airports. Don't travel with me because at airport it can be really bad. And but that day when that happened to me, I had two choices in front of me. I said, I will hug the bitch down and actually slap her to actually she took everything from my flat. Or I said I don't give a shit. I was just going decided not to do the shit. I took, took the high road, and this is exactly what I thought. If people tell me, how you seem always so happy, it's like, because most of the things I just don't care. I don't have the time to, and you shouldn't either. Do something that you like, and don't care about the petty base of the petty thing. This is, there's no good, to answer the question, there's no good time, it just happens. But make it happen if it doesn't. Please do try to do stuff. Whether it's the stupid shit like me that's just jumping up a tower, whether it's actually relevant, do stuff. It really, really changes your, your perspective on life. Thank you. Uh, if you want to chime in, just wave your hand and roll up. Oh, we have another question here. Hello. <laughs> I suddenly don't see you because I have a projector in front of my eyes, but I, I'll show it to you. Hello. Uh, you uh -huh. Okay. My name is Tatiana. And, um, I like to make myself uncomfortable too because I'm really uncomfortable right now. But um, I'm just going to ask a question uh, about the fear. So you, you know how you said that the fear is in the identity. Yeah. But what about what if the fear comes from the fact that maybe technology can interfere with people's second question, like where do they want to go? And what if technology doesn't help them but actually kind of stop them at times? Um, of course. You're right. Yeah, and, and how do you change that? If the fear lies in identity, how do you change that? Like, people getting... So I don't think you can change identity. I don't think you can change who you are. You were born in X or Y, you know, so I pre passed my mother was from Finland, she passed away in a from my father is from Greece, I was born in Switzerland, and I was I grew up there, so I learned some of the work ethics and skills you have, or whatever. You don't truly really change that. But you manage that, that's different. You can hate your neighbor. I will maybe still hate my neighbor, but I'm going to manage the anger and the display I show to that neighbor. So I don't think you can actually really totally change who you are. You change the displays of that behavior towards others and towards yourself. That's the thing. As to technology, sometimes it puts blocks. I'm very being hopeful here. Sometimes it blocks, it doesn't even enable you. Like, I think, it, I think that's, that's why it's a journey. Because sometimes you have to Google and invent the right technology, and sometimes the technology that you thought was the right is actually backfiring and not being used the way you should be using it. Or the way actually that, you know, the, the compulsiveness of some of the technologies we use today. So this is a choice as well. For instance, what I did, I deleted for a few months my Facebook, not the account, but the app on my phone, simply. And I said, I'm not, because this is not my time, this is me having to be in your time, which is great, but when I have so many things to do, sometimes I don't want to spend, like, you know, you know how Facebook is, like freaking Wikipedia, and you said, oh, five minutes, and three hours later, it's still on it, right? So, I decided simply to cut it away from me. I, it's hard, it's like, you know, quit smoking or something, right? Uh, so, it's not easy, but I think it's actually necessary that we try to do these kind of things, to, to act on these type of, when, you know, when you ask people, they know. If I tell you that, you didn't even have to mention which technologies were not enabling, but you know them. You know, you, when you're a smoker, you know it's a bad thing for you. When you eat too much, you know it's a bad thing for you. When you don't exercise, you know it's a bad thing for you. 
You don't like, you can like yourself about what you do about it, but you know it. It's just a decision. Like, like time, 10 years ago, when I decided to change my life, it was a decision. You know what? This is what I was trying to say. There's no schedule, but once you do it once, once you say, you realize, that, you know, there were times I didn't have any money on the bank account. I'm still here. You, what? I'm old at 40. <laughs> so that old. Yes, I am. I am old and a little far, but you, you, you come, not that you come back always, and you, you, maybe there's a bit of natural bias, currently bias, because you tend to think that, again, I'm privileged. You know, I know that I come from a privileged background, not as a wealthy background, but a privileged background. But there's small things you realize that it's okay. You know, the first time you jump, it's okay. I really think I only stayed for 15 hours in the ground. I wanted to do a second time. The same thing happens, basically, for everything. The first time you launch a business, you're like, oh God, maybe you'll fail, but once you've done it once, the first time you kiss a girl or a boy, it seems like so freaking difficult, and then just do it, it's easier. You have to do it once, I suppose. Thank you. So I know you already mentioned this during your presentation, but if you can repeat it, what slides your fun? I'm going to actually, because since I mentioned, I'm going to say one thing, very simple thing. Do an experiment. Walk in on uh, the streets, and smile. And you'll be amazed that 80% of the people will actually smile back at you when you don't know them. So that's what sparks me, smiles. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Paul.